guys and welcome back to my channel for another midweek mystery video. First up I just want to say for the next couple of weeks these videos are probably going to be quite sporadic because I'm moving house and I don't know what's going to happen with like internet and having time to film and having a filming background and stuff like that so bear with me but there will be moving vlogs as well as these videos I just don't know what days these are going to go up or what days the moving vlogs are going to go up. I think the first moving vlog will be going up tomorrow so Thursday so if you want to keep an eye out for that that would be great and I think that's it, that's it, let's talk about the mystery. So today we're going to be talking about the disappearance of Lorene Rahn. So Lorene was 14 years old when she went missing on the 26th of April 1980 from Manchester, New Hampshire in the USA. She was about 5 foot 4, she weighed about 90 pounds and she had brown hair and blue eyes. She also had a very significant scar on her upper leg. Lorene lived with her mum Judith in a third floor apartment in New Hampshire. She went to Parkside Junior High School and she was quite a good student there. Everything I've read said that she got good grades and was just generally quite well behaved. So Judith's boyfriend at the time was actually a professional tennis player. So of course he went around to a lot of tennis tournaments across the country um, and usually Judith and Loreen would go with him. However on this occasion Loreen asked her mum if she could stay at home and just have a couple of friends around um, and for this occasion Judith agreed and said it was okay seeing as she was only going to be gone during the day to be back by around midnight. So Loreen spent the evening with a male and a female friend. Um, the names of these friends have never been released to the public so of course they were underage so we just refer to them as male and female friends. She spent the evening just hanging out, drinking beer with her friends. I'm sorry, I'm like, it's 1am, I'm in my pyjamas, but I was editing this and I've just realised that a whole clip's like gone. I don't know where it's gone, it's not on my laptop, it's not on my camera, I don't know where it's gone. Um, but I've got two important bits of information I need to share with you, otherwise this video doesn't really make sense. And I just don't have time to refilm it properly, so you're going to have to excuse pyjamas and the no makeup and just the grossness. Um, anyway, so the two important bits of information. Number one, when Judith arrived home from the tennis tournament at midnight that night, she actually found all of the light bulbs in the hallways unscrewed. So she arrived back to her apartment in darkness. Now, I haven't been able to like gather as to whether it was only the hallways that the lights had been unscrewed in or if it was actually in her apartment, but from what I can gather, I think it's just the hallways. So obviously that's very strange to not arrive home to. Um, just complete darkness and then Judith also found the front door to our apartment was unlocked. Now also earlier in the night I'd mentioned the male friend that was hanging out with Lorene and her other friend um, and the male friend was actually left earlier in the night. He had thought he'd heard Judith in the hallway and so he ran out the back door. Um, he went down the fire escape and when the boy was actually questioned by police after Lorene went missing um, he said that he'd heard Lorene lock the back door behind him. Now to me why would Lorene lock the back door but then neglect to lock the front door? Maybe that could have been a mistake. I do think it could be significant in a case like this. But anyway, back to regularly scheduled Georgia. Okay. So Judith returned home around midnight and peeked her head into Lorene's room and saw that Lorene, or who she thought was Lorene, was actually asleep in her bed. It wasn't until the next morning when Judith woke up and Lorene's friend actually came out of the bedroom and said Lorene. And Lorene's female friend said to Judith that the last time she'd seen her was she had gone to sleep on the sofa. Now, of course, Lorene wasn't on the sofa in the living room. However, her brand new shoes and her clothes and her bag were all in the living room. But she was nowhere to be found and she's never been seen since that day. So the police originally suspected that Lorene was just your standard runaway child. However, Judith refused to believe this. She said that Lorene wouldn't have left without her clothes and her shoes and her bag. It seemed that Lorene had just disappeared out of nowhere and to be honest I don't think Judith thought that Lorene had any reason to run away. From what I've said before she was quite a good kid, she had good grades. Um, I don't think she had a particularly difficult home life so she, why would she run away from that? However the police did state that it seemed that Lorene had left intentionally and maybe she'd left for a short amount of time and then intended to come back. It was only after a lot of time had passed and Lorene hadn't returned that the police started to take this more seriously. So many months after Lorene went missing on the 1st of October 1980, Judith discovered that three phone calls had been charged to her home line from California. The way phone lines used to work apparently was you could charge any call from anywhere in the country to your landline. You just had to either call the operator and tell them that you wanted to charge the call to this particular number or I think sometimes you had a pin number which you had to enter to be able to charge it to this line. Um, so it seems that Lorene, Lorene or somebody else had called 
from a phone in California and then charged it back to her mother's landline. However, Judith and Lorene didn't have any relatives in the area at that time and they had absolutely no ties to California at all. Two of the three calls had been placed from a motel in Santa Monica to another motel in Santa Ana. Um, and the third call was actually a call to a teen sexual assistance hotline. The biggest possibility here is that it was Lorene making these calls. Obviously, she would have known her home number and she would have known the pin to be able to do this. So it makes sense that it would have been her. However, because of the way the phone lines worked in these times, there was a big possibility of like phone fraud. So it could have been somebody else and just a massive coincidence that it ended up being the number of a mother whose child had recently gone missing. So until this happened, the police really had no clues, no leads whatsoever. But when these three calls took place, they started to look into it a little bit more. Now, the teen sexual assistance number that was dialed was actually run by a physician. And he originally denied knowing anything about it. He said he didn't recall any call from a girl named Doreen. Um, he didn't really know much. However, five years later, in 1985, he completely changed his story. He said that sometimes his wife took in runaway girls. And he said one of these girls may have been from New Hampshire. Now, obviously, New Hampshire is in the northeast of the USA and California is way the other side of the country on the west coast. So it probably would have, like, he would have remembered if there was a girl from New Hampshire because that's a long way for a child to go. Now, this physician, whose name I wasn't able to get hold of, actually claimed that his wife was friends with a woman named Annie Sparkle. And Annie Sparkle was very involved in the pornography industry. Now, of course, the police looked into this, scanned many of Annie's films and didn't ever see Lorene in any of them. Turns out she had, she had no involvement in this case whatsoever. They've never been any, able to find anything to link her to it. Um, I think there's a big issue around sex workers in these sort of missing person stories, always being dehumanised. And as soon as you find out somebody's a sex worker, say a prostitute goes missing, you immediately dismiss it. It's always like obviously dodgy, something bad happened to them. However, I think this is quite a bad way to think about it. Of course, they're humans too, and sex work isn't necessarily an awful thing. Um, so I think it's very easy to hear the word pornography and to hear they worked in the sex industry and assume they weren't good people. However, Annie was an activist. She fought for safe sex worker rights. She, like most of her films, were very feminist based. Um, so she wasn't a bad person and there was a lot of people who said the physician was just trying to portray Annie in a bad light by getting her involved in this. When really there's no evidence whatsoever to suggest that Annie was involved in any way whatsoever. In 1986, Judith actually hired an investigator to go to California and look up these motels and see what he could find. So authorities said that one of the motels was likely used in videos for a child pornographer made by a man called Dr. Z. Now, no link has ever been made between Dr. Z and Noreen apart from the motel and the phone call. However, this phone call hasn't even been like confirmed there was Noreen that made it. It could have just been a fluke. So although from a lot of what I've been saying, you're probably immediately thinking it's definitely sex trafficking or it's definitely human trafficking and they could be the only options in this case. However, if you think about it, all of the pornography links are very loosely based on these three phone calls which haven't even been confirmed to be Lorene. You've got no recordings of a voice, you've got nothing that links it to Lorene at all. All you've got is a link to the phone number, which just could be fraud. However, there are more phone calls to talk about. For a long time after Lorene's disappearance, Judith would always receive a phone call around 3.45 a.m. and she'd answer the phone and there'd be nobody on the other end. She couldn't hear breathing or anything, she just couldn't hear anything at all. And she had just talked to the phone because she thought it could have been Laureen on the other end. And there's a possibility it is Laureen and maybe this is the only time that she felt safe to be able to call her mum. Maybe she just wanted to hear her mum's voice and feel comforted. Judith also received a lot of these calls around the holiday period. So again, maybe a time that Laureen needed to be comforted and hear her own mother's voice. So again, in 1986, one of Laureen's childhood friends, Roger Moray, received a call from a woman who actually identified herself as either Laurie or Laureen couldn't quite hear and it was Roger's mum who actually answered the call. Apparently the woman on the other right end identified herself as Laurie or Laureen and said that she used to be a girlfriend of Roger. This woman has never been identified, they've never been able to confirm it's Laureen, it could have just been a complete prank. Again this could link into all the phone calls that her mother Judith received, um, however it doesn't really make sense that if Laureen does have access to a phone and she's trying to call Judith why would she not like say to her who it is but she would willingly say it to a random woman who answers the phone when it's meant to be her friend Roger. 
bit weird. Now, Judith herself believes that Lorene is alive and well, but she thinks that Lorene was probably kidnapped or abducted or just left of her own accord. Um, she believes that those three phone calls from California were made by Lorene herself. And Judith continued receiving the calls for a long time, for a few years after Lorene disappeared. They only stopped when Judith remarried and relocated down to Florida and obviously she changed her phone number, which I personally think is such a brave thing to do, cut herself off from the only thing that she thinks is linking her to her daughter, but that must be a hell to live in. Judith does also believe that the two friends that Lorene was with the night she disappeared know more about her disappearance than they originally disclosed. However, the male friend actually committed suicide in 1985. He was never considered a suspect of any sort, um, but he did commit suicide, which I, on Reddit, I read a lot of people think that this could have been linked to guilt and maybe felt guilty over what happened to Lorene, but I think that's a very dangerous path to go down because people commit suicide for a lot of reasons. Mental health isn't that simple. And now we have some theories, and to be honest, these theories aren't particularly intense there's not there's nothing really there is there like i've spoken a lot in this video but if you think about it not much of it is really evidence it's all just very circumstantial um so one theory is that maybe Lorene did leave of her own accord maybe she left to go and visit that male friend that had left earlier in the night and i'm not saying the male friend was involved in any way so maybe Lorene was kidnapped or abducted on her way to see this friend um, maybe she just couldn't sleep and went for a wander, but it doesn't make sense why she wouldn't take her new shoes, but maybe she wore old shoes and got kidnapped and abducted. There's a good chance if she was abducted by somebody, then maybe she's now dead and she was murdered um, and all the calls were just a fluke. However, this doesn't explain why all the lights in the hallway were removed. Um, the only explanation I could think of as to why all the lights were removed is maybe somebody did enter the apartment and kidnapped Loreen in the apartment. So you removed all the lights, so if somebody was coming it would take them longer to figure out what was going on. However, this seems like a lot of effort to go to for a kidnapper, and also if there was a kidnapper in the apartment and somebody took her, why did they only take Loreen and not her female friend? Why did the female friend not hear anything? It just doesn't really make much sense. And the third theory is that maybe Lorene was talking to somebody um, and she left the house to go meet this person and this person maybe could have been involved in human trafficking or the sex trade and Lorene left to lead this life with this person. And that is pretty much all the theories. I think it's either two options. She got kidnapped and is now li living in human trafficking or she got kidnapped and then got murdered. I don't see why she would have left of her own accord necessarily, um, but maybe she did and maybe she's living happily somewhere. There's just nothing really to back up the fact that she would have wanted to run away. Um, and that's it. So as always, if you enjoyed this, give it a thumbs up and make sure you subscribe to my channel. I'm so close to 20,000. I think by the time this goes up, I probably would have reached 20,000, which is so exciting. So thank you so much for just looking at me. <laughs> I've got a friend. Hi. What do you think happened to Lorene? Were you listening to any of it? A little bit not. No, she was watching YouTube. <laughs> Never mind. And also, please let me know any suggestions of who you want to see. I actually really want to do more on people of colour, because I was looking back at these videos and I realised I've done all white people, which I think is really bad. Well, what I've actually found is that when I'm doing my research on these things, there is a lot less information on black people have gone missing oh, than white people, which I think is kind of disgusting. I think yeah, I just sort of like horrible. reflects the media's opinions yeah. on like, yeah. white people versus so black like black person. people. Look going into that sound or something. Yeah, I, I think I will. But anyway, yeah, any suggestions, but particularly people of colour, please let me know because I really want to like delve more into that. Yeah, so thank you so much for watching. Bye guys.